Good evening. This is an extraordinary period for America's economy. We've seen triple-digit swings in the stock market. Major financial institutions have teetered on the edge of collapse, and some have failed. As uncertainty has grown, many banks have restricted lending. Credit markets have frozen, and families and businesses have found it harder to borrow money. We are in the midst of a serious financial crisis. Financial assets related to home mortgages have lost value during the housing decline, and the banks holding these assets have restricted credit. As a result, our entire economy is in danger. More banks could fail, including some in your community. The stock market would drop even more, which would reduce the value of your retirement account. The value of your home could plummet. Foreclosures would rise dramatically. And if you own a business or a farm, you would find it harder and more expensive to get credit. More businesses would close their doors, and millions of Americans could lose their jobs. Even if you have good credit history, it would be more difficult for you to get the loans you need to buy a car or send your children to college. And ultimately, our country could experience a long and painful recession. Imagine you suddenly find yourself in a world where the foundation of the global economy crumbles beneath your feet. It's 2008, and the financial system, once thought to be robust and unshakable, has entered a state of unprecedented crisis. Banks that were deemed too big to fail are collapsing, stock markets are plummeting, and the housing market, once a symbol of prosperity, is now a graveyard of foreclosed dreams. People are losing their jobs, their savings, and their sense of security. The ripple effects are felt worldwide as economies falter, and governments scramble to respond with bailouts and stimulus packages. Trust in the financial system, built up over decades, is shattered overnight, leaving individuals and institutions alike questioning the very principles that have guided economic decisions for generations. And we can put that check in a money market mutual fund. Then we'll reinvest the earnings into foreign currency accounts with compounding interest and it's gone. Bitcoin was created to fix this mess, but during the process, something changed dramatically. Since 2017, the Bitcoin that fixes money is Bitcoin Cash. And here's the secret that finance and BTC maximalists hide from the public. It is 2024 and the legacy financial system is still paralyzed and inefficient, struggling to adjust to the rapid advancements in technology and the evolving needs of global commerce. This system, burdened by outdated infrastructure, excessive intermediaries and opaque processes, fails to provide the transparency, speed, and accessibility that modern consumers and businesses demand. This system of trusted third parties also fails to provide self-sovereignty to the individual. Bitcoin is not fixing this anymore, at least for the overwhelming majority who would never pay transaction fees worth $50 or even $2 to begin with. The money of the future has to be fast, reliable, and cheap to use. If it comes with considerable transaction fees, then it is worthless as money. You know, right now, a Bitcoin transaction costs five cents, which is fine right now because PayPal's fees are even stupider, but the internet of money should not cost five cents a transaction. It's, it's kind of absurd. Bitcoin does not fix any of the money issues with the currently prevailing BTC version, since the BTC community does not support mass adoption and ignores the needs of the public. You are not welcome in Bitcoin, but you are welcome to keep buying via centralized platforms and undertake serious risks for your funds. Bitcoin diverted from its original path and remained a vague experiment. It was just a dozen individuals who reshaped history and twisted Bitcoin into a service for the already privileged and powerful. Since 2017, Bitcoin Cash fixes all the above. And as we find out in the process, Bitcoin Cash also saved the mainstream BTC version from a humiliating deterioration. Bitcoin Cash is the brave new coin, the righteous one, the one that manifests the crypto revolution. Since 2017, Bitcoin Cash, BCH, has been the only Bitcoin version that still pursues global adoption of P2P electronic cash. In Bitcoin Cash, we find developers, investors, businesses, and a driven community with an honest and professional approach, seeking to bring positive disruption far from the failures of legacy finance 
and to uphold the true values of Bitcoin as described in Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper and as expressed by the early Bitcoin community. Blockstream, backed by various financial institutions like AXA and MasterCard assumed control of developments in 2015, ousted the Satoshi era developers and supported scalability stagnation. It is evident that the scaling promises about Layer 2 networks have not been fulfilled, and it's unlikely that they ever will. Bitcoin Cash is there as proof that the blockchain scales and meets global demand for borderless, permissionless, and censorship-resistant digital cash. Bitcoin Cash is concrete evidence of Bitcoin's scalability. In addition to securing a permissionless person-to-person -person payment system, free from centralized control and custodial mechanisms, Bitcoin Cash also saved BTC from a devastating inflation bug. In 2018, a critical inflation vulnerability was introduced into the Bitcoin Core Code, which could have allowed malicious actors to artificially inflate Bitcoin supply. This serious flaw was identified by a developer from the Bitcoin Cash community, who promptly alerted the Bitcoin Core team, thereby preventing what could have been a catastrophic outcome. The bug in question was coded by developer Matt Corallo, and, despite supposedly being audited by several other core developers, it was accepted into Bitcoin. Rather than share responsibility for this oversight, much of the blame was placed solely on Corallo. He eventually stepped down from his role, calling out the toxicity that had taken root in the Bitcoin development community. Despite Bitcoin Cash developers' crucial role in averting a catastrophic failure, this fact remains obscured and is rarely acknowledged. There is a fundamental feature the Bitcoin Cash side fiercely promotes. Scalability. To address growing transaction demand and compete with established payment networks like Visa and MasterCard, Bitcoin Cash increased the block size limit in alignment with technological advancements as defined by Moore's Law. The approach of Bitcoin Cash starkly contrasts with the core developer's decision to sustain the block size limit of the BTC network unchanged at one megabyte, leading to much higher fees and slower transaction times. Yet even before the decision to sustain a low block size limit, Bitcoin was already entering the path of obscurity. RBF, or replaced by fee, was detrimental to stalling progress in the adoption race, a technology that allowed participants to replace their transaction within a limited time and before the next block was mined by placing a higher fee. This way, a message propagates on the network that the previous transaction had been replaced and miners would only include the new transaction with the higher fee when building the new block. While RBF seemed revolutionary at the time, the intentions behind it were proven to be even darker than what the Bitcoin community had imagined. Transaction fees used to be low, at a high cost of around 10 cents, and thousands of merchants, businesses, and websites were accepting Bitcoin without having to wait for any confirmation. Maybe the newcomers have no idea that Bitcoin worked exactly as cash should, but indeed Bitcoin was instant, and transaction fees were insignificant in the past. RBF-related scams and apps exploiting zero-conf acceptance quickly emerged, and merchants were not able to accept Bitcoin with no confirmations again. RBF made instant transactions obsolete, and every supposed expert in Bitcoin started claiming how users were always required to wait for confirmations. Each confirmation stands for 10 minutes, which is the average time a new block requires to be mined on the Bitcoin network. The need for one confirmation became quickly six within just a year after RBF, meaning that for a merchant to be sure they would not get scammed and lose their money, they'd had to wait for 60 minutes after the payment was sent. Thus, there was no way for Bitcoin to succeed in commerce again. Instead of following the reasonable approach to scale Bitcoin as transactions were increasing and follow the advance of technology, the leading development team decided instead to push a technology that would only increase fees even more. Certainly fees would have increased without RBF as well, since the one megabyte block limit was acting as a production quota. However, it also rendered zero-conf transactions on the Bitcoin network obsolete by creating the double-spend threat. Adding to the controversy, it was revealed that the creator of RBF, Peter Todd, was funded by an anonymous individual known as John Dillon. Dylan's practices and intentions were later exposed on Bitcoin Talk after his email was hacked, revealing attempts to shift Bitcoin away from its original vision as peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. 
For a relatively small sum of money, Todd complied with Dylan's demands, further fueling concerns about the integrity of Bitcoin Core's direction. John Dylan was one of the infiltrators you often hear about, perhaps the most cunning and notorious one. At one point, John Dylan made it known to Peter Todd he was a secret agent, something that probably Todd already had suspected. Yet Todd's actions were solely driven by rewards. He was a bounty hunter, and as one, he had a job to finish without any intention of understanding the problems Bitcoin was solving under the original intention of peer-to-peer -peer cash. Peter Todd was paid by a man claiming to be an intelligence agent under the alias of John Dillon to implement the feature. The same John Dillon also fronted the money for this propaganda video, which was basically the first time Bitcoin Core really started to rally around the idea of never increasing the block size. So anyhow, this guy basically claims that he works for a government intelligence agency and he's there in the early days of Bitcoin. This is 2013 we're talking about saying, hey, we need to implement replace by fee, which makes Bitcoin less usable as money, makes it harder for people to use it in commerce, makes it harder for people to buy and sell things using Bitcoin on the internet. And he claims, oh, we need to limit the block size. Uh, and he made this propaganda video. If you guys haven't watched it, here's the video here. It's three minutes long. Why the block size limit keeps Bitcoin free and decentralized. Uh, and the arguments in here are basically a bunch of nonsense that uh, if we allow the blocks to become bigger, only big businesses will use Bitcoin. Here's two different horrible, horrible, horrible features that sidetracked Bitcoin from being usable in commerce as money on the internet for people around the world, paid for by an intelligence agency. With the 2017 split, Bitcoin Cash removed RBF, increased the block size limit, and preserved the vision of Bitcoin as a reliable peer-to-peer -peer payment system. The block size increase aligned with the evolution of technology while maintaining decentralization of node operators. In the last 10 years, capacity and speed of hardware and internet connections exploded following Moore's law exactly. Yet the maximalists somehow proceeded with attempts to undermine even logic. Now, more than a decade after these pivotal events, the results of Core's decisions are becoming evident. So the fact you have governors that have interests, or the fact you have a lot of senators that have interests, the fact you have a lot of Congress people that have interests, the fact that you have two of the three major presidential candidates that have interests, the fact that you've got tons and tons of uh, Wall Streeters, you know, you've got representatives from Fidelity and BlackRock and the like. Bitcoin was hijacked and its direction changed to one that was no longer disrupting the legacy financial system. The Lightning Network could never work without custodial hubs, and in 2021, when the product was supposedly ready, we only discovered centralized government-regulated wallets like Chivo, Strike, Wallet of Satoshi. The alternative route of second layers that Core was passionately promoting was nothing else but a mirage, a deceptive strategy to maintain the support of community members who hope to see Bitcoin succeeding in payments. When I joined Bitcoin in 2017, everyone was claiming that I should never accept zero conf, and just to be sure, six confirmations were necessary. I asked everyone how exactly was this going to be the future of money, but nobody had given it any thought. Five months later, Bitcoin Cash emerged and things started becoming a bit more clear, although the sheer amount of disinformation spread by Blockstream increased the time requirements for a newcomer to clear out the valid information from the lies and propaganda. Thus, it took me another two years to realize that the Lightning Network was just another deception and it was never going to work. If Saturday Witness doesn't solve this problem completely, we can always hard fork later with a lot less contention. But give it a chance to solve all of Roger, like all of Roger's problems of scaling Bitcoin. Segwit has a chance to solve it on its own so the problem, without a hard fork, and he's fighting it. The problems that Segregated Witness solves aren't ones that need to be solved urgently. The one that needs to be solved urgently right now is that people's transactions are costing more money than ever before and are slower to confirm than ever before and are easier to be double spent than ever before. That. Segregated Witness doesn't solve that in the short term. Yes, it does immediately.
decided that Bitcoin should have nothing to do with payments, and some maximalists had been sincere about that. Since 2017, BTC has been advertised as a store of value, and the new target was finance and ETFs. There was no more revolution, no more disruption, just a new asset to be sold to wealthy individuals and institutions as some kind of exposure in high volatility. And it had to be just Bitcoin, otherwise the narrative would have instantly failed. Everything else had to be a shitcoin, and maximalists have made sure to send that message out. Bitcoin Cash doesn't require the Lightning Network because it already scales efficiently on-chain. With Lightning fast transactions and fees consistently lower than a penny, Bitcoin Cash demonstrates that the Lightning Network was redundant. It presents proof that blockchain technology can be scalable and efficient without relying on off-chain solutions. Blockstream, during the block size debate, opposed Layer 1 scalability upgrades and still the Lightning Network, according to its white paper, seems to require more than 100 megabyte block size limit to succeed in global scale. This led to the current situation, where the Lightning Network has become a largely custodial solution, making Bitcoin less practical for everyday use. In the middle of the network, the middle of the network, just that word implies that we have a heavily centralized solution at hand here. In the middle of the network, you have really heavy duty data centers and they were illustrated as banks probably the nsa a couple of other people most of them benevolent some of them adversarial as cryptocurrencies pose a significant threat to traditional banking these institutions sought to neutralize bitcoin's potential by exerting influence over its development it's no coincidence that blockstream is funded by the very banks and payment networks that view Bitcoin as competition. A fact that raises serious concerns about whether Blockstream truly acts in the best interests of the Bitcoin community or is attempting to undermine the project and limit its potential. Blockstream executives aggressively promote Bitcoin maximalism, dismissing all other cryptocurrencies as shitcoins, a stance that, while illogical, has effectively rallied a cult-like following around BTC. Moreover, Blockstream's partnerships with questionable entities like Tether and Bitfinex further cast doubt on their integrity and intentions. In 2021, the market cap of Bitcoin BTC was established into a trillion dollars based on lies, deception, and fake narratives. This is not Bitcoin with SegWit, RBF, small blocks, and an unreliable network of payments with fees frequently rising to $50 per transaction. Permissionless money has to be available to all, and not just those who can afford high fees. That was always the use case for Bitcoin. In the early days, it was advertised as being feeless, which was indeed not going to last for long. But if there's one thing Satoshi never expected and addressed throughout his correspondence, it was the high fees BTC has been experiencing since 2017. Imagine Satoshi announcing in 2008 a store of value system instead of peer-to-peer -peer cash. It would have been insanity and nobody would have ever taken this project seriously. In 2024, BTC is not money but something else. Something nobody in that community can even define without looking like a scammer. Um, but it's funny because I don't really consider it my money. It's just in, I've hodled so long that it's just, it's there, but it's, I don't touch it. Like I don't, I'm not going to sell it. Like a, It's not like I think of it as like an active pool of wealth that I can go use for anything else. Like dollars in my bank account. Sure. I'm like, okay, cool. I can go do this with that or that with that. I can go buy this investment or that investment or buy this home or something like that. But with Bitcoin, I don't think about it like that at all. It's just like, I'm never touching this and it's a sizable amount, but I'm not, not ever going to touch it. Number go up, price speculation, trading promotion, and hostility with aggressive trolling suggest an arrogant and ignorant user base with vast networks of spam bots and paid advocates promoting things they never cared about or understood in the slightest. The Bitcoin Cash community is composed of early Bitcoin pioneers dedicated to developing a cutting-edge, permissionless money system for everyone. 
These leaders possess the knowledge, influence, and determination to drive success. While Bitcoin Cash has faced challenges, the network has successfully rooted out malicious actors, high-profile individuals who sought to seize control, impose taxes, and alter the core principles of the ecosystem for personal gain. Bitcoin represented more than just a vehicle for speculation. It was envisioned as a revolutionary tool for peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash, not merely as a Wall Street asset. Treating Bitcoin as just another speculative instrument is both disrespectful and degrading, yet this was precisely the agenda of those who sought to control it. Anyone with even a basic understanding of business, banking, and finance can see what transpired. Bitcoin was hijacked and its disruptive potential was deliberately curtailed. Through the popular crypto websites controlled by DCG and Blockstream, the community's belief in peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash was mocked and maximalism was promoted to sustain the new narrative imposed by financial elites who had infiltrated the space. The majority of the Bitcoin community supported on-chain scaling, which posed a threat to Blockstream's agenda. But their plan was already in motion just months after Satoshi's departure. The propaganda from BTC maximalists continues to shape the cryptocurrency landscape. But as time passes, more people are uncovering the truth. A new crisis is inevitable, the only thing every economic model can guarantee. 2008 will be repeated and BTC will not save the individual. With bank runs and capital controls, you might find yourself stuck in hours-long ATM lines, struggling to withdraw a mere $50 daily limit. And that's only in case your bank hasn't collapsed. BTC will not be there for you, and you better not expect any centralized platform to comply with your request to withdraw at times of uncertainty. For the rest of the Bitcoin community that chose to embrace the true vision of decentralized, permissionless money that Satoshi originally conceived, Bitcoin Cash is the genuine embodiment of Bitcoin and will establish itself as the beacon of financial freedom. Bitcoin Cash remains a reliable alternative, allowing you to maintain access to your funds without intermediaries and using your coins instantly without having to waste a significant amount of Satoshis on transaction fees. Bitcoin Cash delivers on the promise of fast, low-cost transactions, empowering users to transact with ease and efficiency. Bitcoin Cash is for everyone, especially for the people who live with less than $2 per day. In a world where accessibility and affordability are paramount, Bitcoin Cash is the true testament to Satoshi's revolutionary vision, embodying the spirit of decentralized finance and paving the way for a future where everyone can participate in the global economy without barriers.